afternoon. Today's lecture is titled Financial Evaluation of Capital Investments. You would recall that in the last lecture we had talked about the role of models in production management and we had uh, seen a variety of models that would help us take decisions pertaining to various aspects at various stages in the whole life cycle of, a pro uh, of uh, production management. One of the key decisions which is to be taken right at the beginning and also during the various stages of the life cycle is the decision of investing money in various capital equipment and therefore today we are going to talk about some of the fundamental principles of evaluating financial investments and we shall be talking about what are the major criteria or effectiveness measures that can be used to find out if a particular investment is worthwhile or not. Some of the issues for discussion in today's lecture are to look at any new venture or any new investment as a stream of cash flows. That means it involves some initial expenditure, it has some operating costs, it gives some revenues, there might be a solvage. So what is happening is that there is a stream of cash flows involved in every project of this nature. <coughs> Next we will talk about the time value of money which is fundamental to evaluating such investments. We will talk about the six rate of return formulas which help us to evaluate different types of cash flows. We will also talk about the notion of depreciation which is in fact central to the computation of taxes. We will see how taxes are computed in real life and then we will talk about computation of both the before and after tax cash flows and based on this the three most important measures the net present value, the internal rate of return and the payback period which give us an idea of how effective the investment proposal is. And then based on these criteria we would do an evaluation of uh, the investment and find out how the whether the investment is really worthwhile or not. So this is a general procedure which has to be adopted whenever you are talking about evaluating capital investments. Let us see for instance how cash flows are generated. Take a simple example just to illustrate the basic concept. Suppose we are intending to buying a, buying a machine which costs 10 lakhs of rupees. This machine produces let us say 100 pieces per day and each piece is sold for rupees 25. So we know that our daily sales is going to be 100 into rupees 25 that we know and the maintenance expenses average rupees 500 per day. So if we assume 300 working days in a year what would be the profile of expenditure for the next 5 years. We can easily say that in the beginning at time 0 our investment is 10 lakhs. So this is shown as a minus 10 in terms of lakhs of rupees here in the beginning and subsequently in each year we are getting a net revenue of 6 lakhs of rupees after accounting for the revenue and the maintenance expenses. So basically this is how we would convert a real problem into a series of cash flows. So the cash implications of this particular uh, new machine would be in terms of this particular cash flow and we would then have to evaluate this cash flow to find out whether the machine is worthwhile or not. But before we do that the fundamental concept that we all must know is the notion of the time value of money. We all would agree with this statement I hope a rupee today is more valuable than a rupee one year hence. For instance if somebody takes a loan from you of let us say 100 rupees today you would not expect 
100 rupees to be given back to you after one year or two years. Why? A variety of reasons. Some of the reasons are listed here. For instance, the current possession of money is preferred to promises of the future. That is one thing. There are always uncertainties in the future and therefore you say a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. So you have this logic. The second thing is that money can earn positive returns. If you have some money today, you can uh, at least put it into the bank and at the end of the year you would have more money because the money has earned some uh, interest on it. And uh, in fact, next year even the interest would now be capable of generating more money. Similarly, if you have a situation where there is inflation, where a rupee today represents a greater real purchasing power than a future rupee. Right? So all these kinds of reasons can in fact be accommodated by assuming that money has a time value and depending upon the relative impact of these individual factors, you can choose an appropriate value for the time value of money and uh, do the whole computations. For instance, we could say that uh, the major thing to understand here really is that if you have a present sum of money at time p, this money can grow to a future amount a and you know if it is compounded at a rate of interest i, then you will have a is equal to p into 1 plus i to the power of n, that is the formula. So this process of going from the present to the future is called compounding and the reverse process of trying to find out the present worth of a future sum of money is called discounting. So discounting and compounding would be in fact uh, just possible by using this general formula and uh, you can use these two terms to find out what you have to do. So if you have future streams of cash flow, you will have to discount them to the future value and if you are interested in finding out what the amount would be worth after a number of years, you will have to compound the amount. So this is uh, how you would do the whole uh, operation. Now let's talk about the six major formula that we have in, for making these investments. You see the first and the simplest formula is that you are given the present sum P which is uh, suppose this is the cost of the machine right now or if this is the amount that you want to put in the bank right now then what would be the amount f that you would get in the future after n periods. Now this amount is simple f is equal to p into 1 plus i to the power of n. So this is actually a compounding process and uh, this factor here in the square in the rectangle 1 plus i to the power n is actually the compounding factor for single payments. That means you can multiply a single payment p with this particular factor and get the future sum of what that particular amount would finally work out to. So this is called 1 plus i to the power n is called the compounding factor for single payments. Compounding factor single payments that is the name of this particular factor. You might like for instance in the second situation to find out the present value of a future sum. So if you are getting let us say 5 lakhs of rupees at the end of 10 years, you would be interested to find out what is that money worth right now. So basically you are interested in finding out the value of p and p is equal to f into 1 upon 1 plus i to the power of n. So this factor now in the rectangle is nothing but the present value factor for single payments. And uh, the present value factor when you multiply this with the future amount you get the present value of that particular value. Okay. So that is the second formula that is commonly used in this uh, connection. Quite often what happens is that uh, you have streams of cash flow with equal amount of installment being paid or being accrued annually. For instance, you can say that uh, if you keep
keep on depositing in a recurring deposit amount say 1000 rupees each year you want to find out what would be the future value of the sum at the end of n years without going into the detailed mathematics of this it's pretty simple because this amount has to earns an interest for n minus 1 years this amount earns an interest for n minus 2 years for n minus 3 years and so on so if you sum up that geometric series you get that f the future sum is equal to a into 1 plus i to the power n minus 1 divided by i and this particular factor within the rectangle is typically known as compounding factor for annuity. So this is an equally equal annual payment called an annuity and the future worth of that is the compounding factor for the annuity. So this is the factor that we have. You can very easily derive this from the principles that I have just mentioned. Then the next formula is a formula where you want to know uh, the equivalent annuity for a future sum which is in fact just the reverse to the one that we have just seen. So basically you want to find out that if at the end of 10 years I want to accumulate 10 lakhs of rupees what should be the amount that I should deposit annually. So this is A. So A would be then just the reverse of the previous factor. A would be F into I divided by 1 plus i to the power of n minus 1 and this factor is known as the sinking fund deposit factor. It is equivalent to saying that you have to sink this much of fund annually to get the final uh, future sum f in that order. So you can easily determine this particular factor. And then we might have a situation where we have a present worth p or a present expenditure p and we want to maybe pay it in n equal installments. This is what would happen for instance if you want to buy an automobile on a loan. Right? You want to get let us say a loan of 5 lakhs of rupees and you want to pay it in 5 or 10 installments as the case may be and so you are interested in finding out for instance uh, both the things. In this case we are interested in finding out what is the present worth of this stream of annuity figures. So that value here would be p is equal to a into 1 minus 1 plus i to the power of minus n divided by i and the factor here is referred to as present value factor for an annuity. So if you are given an annuity that means an equal sum of payments if you multiply this with the present value factor for annuity you get the present worth of that particular amount. So this would be the factor that is typically used by all these uh, various banks when they compute your installments and try to find out what exactly is uh, how much is due to you on a certain one, rate. Yeah it is 1 plus i to the power minus n that is right this one. And finally we can look at the reverse problem and in the reverse problem you have for instance you want to find out what is the equivalent annuity for a present sum. So this is more the uh, problem where you are saying that you are taking a loan of P and you want to find out what should be the cash installment A to recover that amount. So you can see here this would be A is equal to P into I divided by 1 minus 1 plus I to the power minus N and uh, this would be equal to p into this factor is typically called the capital recovery factor. So by using these six formulas it generally becomes much more convenient to convert any stream of cash flows into either the present worth or the future worth or whatever you need for purposes of analysis. So these are the basic tools you require for dealing with a stream of cash flows. Let us now take an example and let us try to illustrate how you would uh, use these concepts and similar concepts to basically uh, determine the worthwhileness of the project. So just a simple project 
Suppose a project has the following data, we need the initial investment. So, we say let us say the initial investment in the project is 3 lakhs of rupees. The annual cost of operation, let it be 20,000 rupees, annual cost of operation. Expected annual revenues by selling off whatever you, whatever the project does is uh, assumed to be variable. We say it is 1 lakh rupees per annum for the first 2 years and subsequently it is 2 lakh rupees per annum for the next 3 years and the planning horizon that we are considering is 5 years. Okay. The typical, it is a situation for a project that we have generated which is realistic enough so that we can use this data to see what kinds of uh, financial uh, parameters this particular project has. Uh, the first thing that has to be done is for instance to talk about the investment, the yearly costs and the revenues for this particular project. We had seen that the revenue in the first year was uh, 100,000 rupees, in the second year it was 100,000 rupees, in the three subsequent years it was 200,000 rupees and so on. This could be because of the maturing of the project, there could be some initial reasons for having low revenues and then subsequently when things stabilized you get higher revenues. And the typical costs would be, now when we are talking about costs, there is a cost of investment in the initial period which is at time 0, 300,000 rupees, 3 lakhs and then subsequently the operational cost is 20,000 rupees for each of the 5 years and this is their planning horizon of 5 years. So, we have listed out on a time scale our revenues and costs in that uh, manner and we can now determine the stream of cash flows uh, for this particular situation. So, what would happen is that the gross cash flows for this project would be minus 300,000 right in the beginning which is the investment and uh, the net revenues after taking into consideration various types of costs 80,000, 80,000, 180,000, 180,000 and 180,000. So, this is always the first step that is involved in evaluating any project to determine the gross cash flows. So, we have determined the gross cash flows, in this case all cash flows are in thousands of rupees, but these are gross figures. Okay. What we can do after this for instance is to compute what we call the undiscounted cash flows before tax. undiscounted means we are not taking the time value of money into consideration or we are assuming that the interest rate for time discounting is 0, that is what it means. right? And uh, undiscounted cash flows before tax would be therefore, minus 300 in the uh, is the investment at time 0, 80,000, 80,000, 180,000, 180,000, 180,000. So, we can calculate the cumulative cash flow the cumulative cash flow would be minus 300 which is the expense you have in the beginning and minus 300 plus 80 which is what you recover in the first year. So, at the end of the first year you have minus 220,000 that is your balance and then again 80,000 is being recovered in the second year. So, the cumulative cash flow is now 140,000 and similarly at the end of the third year the cumulative cash flow is 40 it is becoming positive only in the third year up to this it was negative right and then similarly in the fourth year you have 220 and then you have 400,000 in the fifth year. So, what you find is the final cumulative value which is 400 is called the net present value of this project. So, the net present value is 400 thousands of rupees here and uh, what you find is that where the cumulative uh, cash flows change sign from negative to positive. Namely, up to the end of second year you are still losing money in that sense, but at the end of third year you have gained some money. So, it shows that somewhere between the second and the third year you have uh, that is the time period where the uh, you have recovered your initial investment in some sense. 
So, you can do linear interpolation between these values and you can get for instance the payback period of 2.78 years. So, this is illustrates to you the basic notion of net present value and the payback period for this kind of problem. Okay. This gives you an idea an investor would like to have as low a payback period as possible because an investor would this is the amount of time in which the initial investment is recovered. So, the higher it is the worse it is the shorter it is the better it is in that sense of the term and the net present value of course, is equivalent to the net worth of the project. So, ultimately after doing all this jamela the entire project is worth 400,000 rupees. So, it is like saying that you get so much money in hand after doing this project that is the implication of the undiscounted cash flow. Okay. Now, let us see what is the effect of discounting. We might want to discount the cash flows for instance at an interest rate of 10 percent. So, the procedure is similar except that you now have a discount factor which is nothing but 1 upon 1 plus i to the power of n the discount factor. So, this is the discount factor at time 0 it is 1 at uh, year 1 it is 0 0.909 at year 2 it is 0 0.826. So, it is like saying that the present worth of a rupee available to me 2 years hence is only 0 0.826 and so on. So, all that you have to do is you have to calculate the discounted cash flow. So, the discounted cash flow is obtained by multiplying the discount factor with the corresponding cash flows. So, 1 into minus 300, 80 into 0 0.909, 80 into 0 0.826, 0.751 into 180, 0 0.683 into 180 and 0 0.621 into 180. So, what you find is that the discounted cash flow is uh, not constant or is not a step function of this nature, but it is changing you know 72 then 66 then 135 and so on. So, in the same manner if we now compute the cumulative discounted cash flow what do you find minus 300 plus 72.72 it is minus 227.28 and so on you keep doing this. So, what you find now is that the cumulative discounted cash flow becomes is negative for the third year and becomes positive in the fourth year. So, somewhere between the third and the fourth year would be the discounted payback. So, the discounted payback for 10 percent rate of interest works out to 3.21 years and the net present value is in fact this final value which is 208.7. Okay. So, this is the discounted cash flow for an interest rate of 10 percent as we have calculated. You could do it for uh, other rates of interest. For instance, at 20 percent rate of interest, we can again calculate the discount factor, which will now be uh, 1 for time 0, 0.833 for time 1, 0.694 for time 2 and so on. It will be 0 0.402 for year 5. This value as you know is nothing but 1 upon 1 plus i to the power of n. So, for different values of n and i is equal to 20 percent this is what you get. Quite often you can refer to tables for finding out these discount factors they are tabulated generally in all financial accounting textbooks. Then you calculate the discounted cash flow which is minus 300, 66.64, 55.52, 104.22, and 72.36 which is the multiplication of the cash flow with the corresponding discount factor. Having got these figures you can again compute the cumulative discount flow discounted flow and minus 300 minus 233 again minus 300 plus 66.64 gives you minus 233.36 minus 177.84 minus 73.62 these are all values in thousands of rupees and here again it is 13.14 and the final uh, net present value now comes to 85.5 here. So, the interest rate for discounting the cash flow that is being talked about sir 
is that dependent upon the inflation rate or the present bank rate so like how is it found yes very relevant question the interest rate for purposes of discounting depends primarily on the bank rate and also other factors like inflation and so on that means it would have to be determined by a company depending upon its own situation for instance if a company has been doing very well and is earning a, a rate of return on its investment of let's say 15 percent whereas the bank rate of interest is only eight percent probably it would expect a minimum rate of return of uh, 15 percent in that sense and then this would have to be adjusted for inflation so they might take 16 or 17 percent as the minimum acceptable rate of return so that is how the value of the rate of return applicable to the firm will have to be found out in that sense okay it would take into consideration all the factors that we considered for the time value of money right but for convenience purposes one rough uh, way of identifying the rate of interest is the bank rate adjusted for inflation and something so something higher than the bank rate in that sense so what you find here is again the cumulative discounted cash flow lies between third and the fourth year and if you interpolate you get a value of 3.85 years for this particular thing so this would be a general procedure that can be adopted to determine the discounted cash flows and the NPV and the payback period and uh, we haven't yet talked about the internal rate of return but why we are doing these computations for different rates of interest is essentially to find out the internal rate of return for instance if we take the interest rate to be 25 percent again you calculate the discount factors which will now be 1.8, 0 0.64, 0 0.512, 0 0.41, 0 0.328, etc. And then the discounted cash flows could be computed as shown. And then the cumulative discounted cash flows could be computed as shown here. And finally, you find that the net present value has come down to only 40.4 thousands of rupees. And another thing you find is that now the payback period lies between year 4 and 5 and if you interpolate you find that the payback period is now 4.32 so this is understandable because if you keep on increasing the rate of interest obviously the net present value is going to come down and the payback period is going to increase in this fashion if we do the same analysis let us say for i is equal to 30% what do you find? You would find for instance that uh, the discount factors in this case are given here. The discounted cash flow would be obtained as shown here. The cumulative discounted cash flow would of course come here. What are you noting here? That the present worth of the NPV has now become only 2.2 thousand. Right? And the payback period would lie somewhere between 4 and 5th year, 4th and the 5th year and in this case the value is 4.95 or very close to 5 because this is almost close to 0 in that sense, right. Uh, what we can then do is, let us try to find out the discounted cash flows for interest rate of 35 percent. we increase the interest rate to 35 percent. If you do that again by following the same procedure, what you find is that the discount factors are 1.741, 1 0.549, 0 0.406, 0 0.301 and 0.223 as we have shown here and the discounted cash flow now becomes uh, simply this into this, this into this. 18 to 0 0.741 which is 59.28 and so on so you have these values and you take the cumulative discounted cash flow and when you take the cumulative discounted cash flow what you find is that all these values are negative and even at the final term the net present value now is negative that is minus 29.40 in thousands of rupees 
you must be wondering as to why we were performing these repetitive calculations and what was the intent of doing all this thing. The intention was to show that progressively the net present values are going down till a situation comes that net present value could in fact become negative and the payback period in this case would be greater than 5 years because it is still negative here. Okay? So, this would throw some light on uh, the notion of what we call the uh, internal rate of return. Okay. So, you see what we have done is we have calculated for instance for we have, this is a plot of the interest on the x axis and the NPV on the y axis. But what we find is that roughly we when we deal with the gross cash flows which is what we are dealing with uh, at interest is equal to 0 they were close to 400 when the interest was made 10 percent they were close to 200 they were 208.7 when it was 20 percent it came to 85.5 and when it was 25 percent it came to 40.4 for 30 percent it came to 2.5 and for 35 percent it came to minus 29.4 so it became negative if you get the points that we have just calculated 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and 6. If you join them with a smooth curve like we have tried to do here. This actually shows how the NPV varies with the rate of interest. Okay, we have only done it for a limited number of 5 points, 6 points. And what you find is the stage at which the NPV is equal to 0, that particular value of i for which the NPV is equal to 0, which can easily be determined from this graph. In this case, this value is 30.35 percent. So, 30.35 percent is called the internal rate of return. Okay. So, the internal rate of return is essentially defined as that particular value of i which makes the NPV equal to 0. And quite often in practice this graphical procedure is a common and convenient method of computing the internal rate of return. Okay. So, for this particular sample project of ours we now know that depending upon the interest rate we can calculate what is the NPV. For instance, if the interest rate is 10 percent, then the NPV for this project is 208.7, which is what we have calculated. But NPV is something which is dependent upon the value of i. So, we have tried to map here the variation of NPV for all particular values of i and also in the process defined IRR, which happens to be that particular value of i for which the NPV is equal to 0. So, this is uh, I think uh, fundamental to the illustration of the three concepts that we were talking about namely the net present value, the payback and the internal rate of return and how you compute them. Similarly, you would have noticed that when you look at the payback period something interesting has happened. If we take a interest rate of 0 percent, we found that the payback period was 2.78 years. If the interest rate was 10 percent, the payback period was 3.21 years and 20 percent it was 3.85, 25 percent it was 4.32 that is what we calculated and 30 percent it was 4.95. For 35 percent, we found that the payback period was greater than 5 years. So, essentially speaking, if I again plot the uh, cumul the cumulative NPV versus the number of years, what, what do you find in this particular situation? You find for instance that in each case at time 0, the unrecovered capital is the investment which is 300,000 rupees. So, you have minus 300,000 and gradually depending upon the type of uh, cash flows, you keep on recovering more and more and when this curve cuts the axis, it is the point where the uh, that is in fact the indication of the payback period. 
for instance for 0 percent it was uh, 2.78 right 1 2 2.78 would be somewhere here the next one would be somewhere here little more than that 3.21 and so on so in effect what you find is that the point where these curves intersect this axis will keep on increasing in this fashion and this will in fact be a function of the interest rate i so this is corresponding to 0 percent interest rate 10 percent and finally 35 percent interest rate where the payback period is again so this is again a graphical interpretation of uh, the significance of the payback period and also how you can compute the payback period for different uh, cash flows and investments for this particular situation here. Let us now move over to something very important in investment appraisal and that is the notion of taxes, tax considerations. How do you compute taxes for any particular situation and for this basically the notion of depreciation is very crucial. Depreciation is used in computing after tax cash flows. That means you have we had so far dealt with before tax cash flows or gross cash flows. But after the company pays a certain tax on its uh, revenues, its cash flows would be uh, called the after tax cash flows. So how exactly computations are performed? Basically, we will talk here about three different methods of depreciation which are commonly used. One is called the straight line method. In the straight line method what happens is that suppose you have an initial investment I. In each year you assume that the amount depreciated is I by N so that at the end of N years the whole amount is depreciated. Okay? It is like saying I have a machine for 100 rupees or 100,000 rupees as the case may be and in each year suppose I want to depreciate in 4 years so I will say that the depreciation for the machine will be 25,000 rupees in each year so that at the end of the 4 years the book value of the machine would be 0. So this is the straight line method which assumes essentially that the total amount of depreciation is the same in each year. Although this is a common method of depreciation, it is generally not preferred by industrialists. Why it is not preferred is they generally preferred, prefer the other methods of depreciation. We have what is called a sum of digits method. Here what happens is it's the amount of depreciation keeps on varying from period to period. What happens is the total amount of depreciation uh, that you have is for instance uh, uh, the amount i right. So, what you do is in the first year you depreciate a sum equal to i into n by s where s is the sum of the digits. So, if uh, sum of the digits is if there are n digits the sum of the digits would be n into n plus 1 by 2 ok. So, i into n by s then the next year it will be i into n minus 1 by s then it will be i by s in the last year. So, the basic idea here is that uh, the maximum depreciation is allowed in the first year, lesser in the next year, lesser in the next year and so on. Now, you might wonder as to what is the basic advantage of this. The basic advantage of this is that the investor gets the maximum advantage here. He gets the maximum advantage in the first year because his depreciation is maximum. He gets lesser advantage in the next year and so on. And because money has a time value, therefore, he would prefer to get the, if I have to give you same amount of benefit, say rather than giving you 50, 50 benefit in two years, it is better to get 80 benefit in the first year and 20 benefit in the next year, because this would ensure that you, the net present value of money, if you take that into consideration, you get the maximum advantage. That is the reason why this kind of depreciation scheme is generally more popular with industry and recognizing this fact the government allows either this or this or the third kind of depreciation which is known as the declining balance. There could be variations of this there could be a declining balance a double declining balance and so on but essentially 
here the depreciation in any period is a constant percentage of the opening value. If an asset is worth a thousand rupees in the first year, let us say we have a 10 percent uh, factor which is constant. That means you would depreciate by 100 rupees in the first year. So, the value of the machine would be 1000 minus 100 which is 900 rupees at the end of the first year. And then in the next year you again in, uh, take 10 percent of that 90 rupees. So, that would be the depreciation and so on. So, here again the quantum of depreciation tends to decline with time. So, that is a desirable feature as far as industry is concerned. So, if the initial value of the asset is i, the values after depreciation in successive periods are a i, a square i, a cube i and so on right that is what it would be. So, whatever method of depreciation you use yeah you might ask a question as to which method of depreciation you would use. Normally depreciation is used primarily for purposes of computing taxes and therefore for a certain class of equipment the government or the taxation body would have specified that this is the kind of depreciation that you can be allowed for. Okay? So, you have to uh, conform to the requirements of law in this case. Let us take our example of the project. What you find here is that there is an initial investment of 300,000 and uh, net cash flows or gross cash flows were 80,000, 80,000 and 180,000 in the 5 years that we had for this. And if we consider depreciation by all the 3 methods, the first one is a straight line depreciation, the second one is a sum of digits, the third is a declining balance. What it would amount to is this machine which is worth 300,000 at the end of 5 years. So, each year you have to depreciate it by 60,000, 300 by 5. So, in the first case the depreciation would be 60, 60, 60, 60, 60,000 in each year. That is the straight line method. In the sum of digits what would it be? It would be 300 which is the total amount to be depreciated. The sum of the digits in this case is 15. So, 5 by 15, 4 by 15, 3 by 15, 2 by 15 and 1 and this adds up to 1 is not it. So, the total amount of depreciation is going to be the same and what we have here is the depreciation here would be 100, 80, 60, 40 and 20. This is what we mean by the sum of digits depreciation and finally, in the declining balance uh, suppose this particular percentage was 0 0.3, 30 percent of the amount. So, in the first year you would depreciate by 90 then uh, in the next year it would be 27, in the next year it would be 8.1 and so on. So, these are depending upon the type of depreciation that is allowed for in a particular situation, you can adopt that and calculate the depreciation. And the advantage then would be that how do we then use this information to calculate our net cash flows we had calculated the gross cash flows. These are our gross cash flows, right? I mean, we are talking about a total investment of 300 and then 80, 80, 180, 180, 180. So, if you talk about uh, straight line depreciation, then the depreciation is 60 each time. So, your taxable income in each year will be 80 minus 60, which is 20, 20, 120, 120, 120. And suppose the tax rate was 30 percent, it could be any tax rate then you say 30 percent of this is 6, 6, 36, 36, 36. So, this becomes the tax and now your after tax cash flows this is the gross income 80 minus 6 is 74, 80 minus 6 is 74 and this is 180 minus 36 is 144 and so on. So, this becomes my after tax cash flows in that sense. So, this is how you uh, make the transition from the gross income to the after tax class flows after taking into consideration the appropriate amount of depreciation in that case. Yes, so we were looking at the computation of uh, taxes and finally the computation of the net cash flows. So, what you find is if you take the example that we were considering. Uh, the gross income was calculated as shown here 
Then what you do is you the amount of depreciation that is to be allowed depends upon the kind of depreciation that you use. So, for instance, if we use a straight line depreciation, the amount of depreciation in the year would be 60,000, 60,000, 60,000, 60,000 and 60,000 in each year. Remember that if we use a different type of depreciation, these amounts could be appropriately altered. But we are going to just discuss the computations with the straight line depreciation. What you find is then that if this is the depreciation, then this was the revenue or the income that you got in the first year. So, 80,000 minus 60,000 becomes your taxable income. Similarly, taxable income in the second year and taxable income in the third, fourth and fifth years would be 180,000 minus 60. That means, you are allowed or permitted by law to pay taxes only on this much because it is assumed that you have incurred this much of depreciation in terms of wear and tear of your machinery etcetera whichever is recognized by the government. So, you can then calculate the tax, the tax is simply the amount on the taxable income and the tax percentage. So, 0.3 multiplied with 20 would be 6. So, 6000 is the tax that you incur in the first year, this is the tax that you incur in the second year. 36 would be the tax that you incur here 120 into 0.3 and 36 in the fourth year and 36. In mm, having computed these taxes quite often uh, one common uh, you can say mistake that beginners make is that they subtract this from the taxable income and show the after tax cash of flows as 14, 14 and so on. But this is not correct. Why? Because the tax, the taxable income is generated only for purposes of computing the taxes. So, this is the actual tax and this is your actual gross revenue. So, from the gross revenue you subtract the tax. This was an intermediate device to calculate the taxes. That is I think what one must understand and ultimately the after tax cash flows can be obtained directly in this manner. So, for an interest rate of 0 percent, the net cash flows can be computed in exactly the same manner and you can calculate the cumulative net cash flow and the net present value is now 280,000. Similarly, the payback will be somewhere between the third and the fourth year, it will be 3.06. Something similar can be done for different interest rates in much the same manner that we did for the earlier example for the gross cash flows. So, if you work with 10 percent rate of interest, you can get the cash flows, you can get the after tax cash flows, the discount factor, the discounted cash flows, the net present values in the same manner. So, these were the net cash flows. So, instead of working with the gross cash flows, we are now working with the net cash flows. Something similar could be done for 20 percent, where the net present value will be 23.68 in thousands of rupees and the payback period would be simply 4.6 years. Similarly, for a rate of interest of 40, uh, 30 percent, the net present value now becomes negative 44.62 and the payback period is greater than 5 years just as it was happening in the earlier case. So, what happens now? What do you see? In this particular situation, again if you plot the net present value versus the interest, we have calculated the NPV of 280, that means this point, 124.31 this point, then this point and then finally, it becomes negative for i is equal to 30. You can tend to join these things with a curve of the same type and the point where the uh, in this uh, NPV becomes 0 somewhere here, this is an interest IRR of 23.5 percent. So, what you find here is if you compare this now with the uh, internal rate of return for gross cash flows which was more than 30 percent, 
the internal rate of return for net cash flows works out to only 23.5 percent. This is uh, I think completing the example and similarly we have this possibility of uh, computing the payback period a graph can be drawn in the same manner where for 0 percent rate of interest the payback period was 3.06 years for 10 percent it was 3.65 years for 20 percent it was 4.6 years and for 30 percent it was greater than 5 years. So, a similar type of behavior, but in this case the payback periods were increasing they were higher than the values that because it now takes more time to really. So, this is the summary of the results what you find is that before tax if you do the calculations interest rates of 0 percent 10 percent 20 percent and 30 percent this is what we considered the NPV here was 400 the NPV here is 280 the NPV here with 10 percent was 208.7 and here it was 124.31 for 20 percent it was 85.5 here and 23.67 here and for 30 percent it was 2.2 here and minus 44.63 here. So, this gives us an uh, idea and similarly the payback periods you will find that after tax the payback period for each case is higher at 10 percent rate of interest before tax you could recover the money in 2.78 years here you are recovering it in 3.06 years and so on the same pattern is actually being debated here in terms. Finally, to conclude our lecture in this particular uh, lecture we have seen the vital role of financial appraisal in overall project evaluation and project evaluation is something that has to be done whether it is the overall project or whether it is a machine procurement in all cases essentially the process is the same. Then we have seen that accounting for the time value of money is important because money has a time value and the rate of interest or the rate of discounting has to be chosen carefully to account for those factors. Then we have seen how we can we have to basically do the uh, estimation of investment yearly costs and revenues to obtain the gross cash flows. So, that is the basic step that we followed and after having obtained the gross cash flows you can use depreciation and tax concepts to obtain the net cash flows and the computation of the NPV IRR or the benefit to cost ratios and payback could then be done easily for either the uh, gross cash flows or the net cash flows. So, in that sense I think uh, this is a very important topic. Now, in the next lecture we shall explore the possibilities of accounting for uncertainty in project evaluations or in financial evaluations whatever we assumed here was deterministic. So, we shall account for uncertainties and risk in the next case and see how the notion of decision trees is in fact something very valuable for evaluating proposals investment proposals in this context. Thank you.